Up on the front line of filth. She's stuff like that's more than likely been dumped, but the, some of the bin bags, I think, have probably just been washed down. In Malvern, after torrential rain led to massive flooding, the enforcement team face a tide of rubbish. I think what I tipped out is mud, water, excrement, all sorts of rotten food. In Buckinghamshire, the hunt is on for a tiresome tipper. The tyres were dumped right in the middle of this road. I was expecting to have a report of somebody swerving into the hedge, at, at least. And in Braintree, enforcement officers on the trail of criminal dog poo litterers... Well, I can't even lift the thing. ..hit the mother load. Yep, we've got maggots. This is a health hazard. Yeah. This is not acceptable. Oh, shit. <laughs> Councils across the country employ a crack team of environmental enforcement officers, duty-bound to guard us from grime and defend us from dirt. Foot soldiers on the front line of filth. It is a bit of a battle, a bit of a war. Taking names. Got to dress you, Donald. And rolling out retribution. We're going to catch you sooner or later. To the little outs who blight our green and pleasant land. Say there's at least 20 tonnes worth of waste in there. But in Malvern... Shall I put the demister on? Yes, please. The war on waste is waged in its own special way. And also, my bottom's warm enough now. OK. For now, at Switched least. Switched off. Switched off. Enforcers Jude and Dan patrol one of the most picturesque patches in the country. 220 square kilometres of it, to be precise. Malvern's probably best known for the beautiful hills. Indeed, yeah. Because we are an that, area yeah. of outstanding natural beauty. Yeah. It's even in our name, Malvern Hills District Council. That's the Malvern Hills. Yeah. <laughs> I love working here because I love green trees, I love nature. But this idyllic rural backwater presents some unique challenges for our very own waste warriors. Car park still very Car park flooded. flooded. That's the field I'm going to have to grow my rice in. After parts of the country endured half a month's rainfall in just 24 hours, Dan and Jude are steeling themselves for the impending clean-up operation. It's devastating when it comes up, and it's also devastating when it goes down. Quite often, it leaves a lot of sludge, and in that sludge, there can be... Oof. Horrible things, sewerage. Um, it doesn't smell well, good, and I'm sure it's not healthy. I don't want to know exactly, to be honest. No. And the clear up cost and, and time can be quite a while. We don't know to what extent yet, obviously. But they're about to find out. As HQ's called them out to a report of domestic waste clogging up the waterways. Why are we coming down here? Um, we, we're looking for bin bags. And these bags have come from houses, a lot of them that have left them out legitimately for their collection. Unfortunately, it's flooded and carried them down. Can't really see much without getting out, but I haven't seen anything obvious. With UK households generating 4.5 million tonnes of food waste a year, there's a risk the floodwaters have washed rotting refuse into the local waterways. Oh, blimey, still wet. This waste needs to be cleared and fast. There's some over there. Yeah, yeah uh, right in the water here as well. Look. Just stop there, a sec. And nothing's going to stop Dan and Jude. <laughs> Except maybe. I'm, uh, I'd, I'd love to get out, Jude, but my feet will get wet. <laughs> really, Dan? Wet feet? The depot lads can't remove it no. while there's water here. No. Because of. Because of water. <laughs> because of the fact it's all waterlogged and We don't know how deep it is in the ditch. Yeah, so we can't put them in danger. A fear of soggy socks may have foiled Dan and Jude this time, but they'll be back once the waters have receded and revealed the full horror lurking beneath. Come on, Eve. We're a nation of dog lovers. Over a quarter of us have our own canine companion. But with Fido comes fouling. And few subjects are more emotive than poo on our pavements. But in Braintree, Essex, it'll take more than a little four-legged faecal matter to put enforcement officers Tony and James 
off their lunch. So many labels on these things. I mean, look at that, four stickers on this apple. I find to be healthy eating these nuts. They're full of salt and fat, man. The big boss, Stuart, has them on a short leash, and he wants something done about the district's doggy doo-doo. What I want you two to do once you've finished filling your faces, some dog fighting. We ain't had no one for dog fighting for a while, have we? No, it's occurring out there, so... Um, Where do you want to go? I'd suggest, I don't know, Discovery Centre. That's a big old area to cover on foot. It is a massive area, but there's a lot of dogs up there, so just use your initiative. Really? And get it covered, within reason. Maverick and Goose. Who's Maverick? It's got to be me. I'm the small one. You're Even Maverick. Goose. Chicken, more <laughs> like. <laughs> Crack on. Braintree's top guns need to get off to a flying start to keep Boss, Stu, off their backs. It's too big of an area to be walking. <laughs> so I've got a cunning plan. What are you thinking? I'd be surprised. Tasked with patrolling 100 acres of waterlogged parkland for doggy droppings, this is going to take some blue sky thinking. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm driving. I feel the need, the need for speed. <laughs> yeah. What's the top speed of this thing, then? 16, 17, 18, 18 19. Nearly getting to dizzy heights of 20, 20 miles an hour. 21. With the four-wheel power to get them to the heart of a dog poo hotspot, there will be an instant £50 fixed penalty fine for anyone they catch. Britain's 10 million dogs drop a whopping 1,000 tonnes of waste every day. A constant problem for our enforcers tasked with keeping our parks and pathways clean. The problem we have, and from previous experiences of big doing foot patrols, especially a park this size, is you can see the event taking place. Of course, by the time you get there, because you're always a distance away, you lose the spot. The boys have the power to issue a £50 fixed penalty notice. But only if they can catch an irresponsible owner in the act. There you go, just pull over here and we'll just keep an eye. This is your... This could be one. Tony's got a secret weapon up his sleeve. He's fluent in doggy language. You can just tell the whole body language changes on a dog. And they get a little bit excited. I don't see any doggy bags. She probably has them in her pocket. Keep looking. Yeah, just here. give me another minute, James. We do quite often come up here and carry out a few patrols fairly regularly. Lots of people allow their dogs to fail and fail to pick it up. Contact with dog poo can cause toxocariasis, a nasty infection that could lead to blindness. So it's imperative it's picked up and disposed of properly. Right up on the top where the sculpture is, we've got a good view. Can we get up to that? I don't know. I don't, I don't think you'd be able to get up in this. It's a 4 before. Do you want to have a go then? Yeah, stick it in four-wheel drive. Nine out of ten dog owners pick up after their dogs, but it still costs councils £22 million a year to clean up after the messy minority. Perhaps a higher vantage point will help the boys find a fowler. you got this woman coming up. He's looking for somewhere to go. She's getting her bag out. It's quite a good viewpoint up here, isn't it? Oh, that's why I thought we'd pick it. Keep your eyes peeled, Tone. Yeah, yeah. I'm on it, like a car bonnet. With no fines in sight, this poo patrol is starting to feel the squeeze. We need some results, I think, mate. Stuart likes results. We need to go back with something to, something to show for all of our efforts. Just when all hope looks lost, Tony picks up the scent. Just pull up here. See, now he's got all the traits of somebody who's looking for somewhere to go for a nice, big, giant country one. We're going to try and cut them off and see if we see from the top end. Like a dog with a bone, Tony won't give up until he gets his canine. Excuse me. Branch of District Council, we've just done some doggy patrols today. Okay. Have you got your bags? Yeah. Can I just have a look, make sure you got them? Perfect. I've got one full of Good food. man, good <laughs> man. Unfortunately for the boys, they've collared a responsible dog owner. With no fines for fouling issued, they'll have to return to base with their tails between their legs. Coming up, 
The stench of receding floodwaters brings back vivid memories for Dan. The last time I smelled something like that was definitely Glastonbury in the long drops at the end of the weekend. Enforcers pursue a reckless tyre tipper, dumping rogue rubber on our roads. We were really quite lucky that nobody got hurt with the result of, of his dumping of tyres. And the mother of all doggy bags... Holy Jesus! ..takes Tony's breath away. <laughs> Malvern has been deep underwater for days. But now the floodwaters have subsided. I don't want to stand too close to the edge. That's what Bono always says. Enforcers Dan and Jude can finally get a look at the festering piles of domestic rubbish. I think I stood somewhere like this and went, oh, look, yeah, there's some bin bags there. And you thought, oh, yeah, I should be able to just go and reach them. But if I had done that, I'm five foot and a titchy, titchy little bit, and I would have, it would have gone straight over my head. It would have done. The recent floodwaters swept bin loads of trash from around the district into Malvern's waterways, depositing piles of rotting domestic refuse in the culverts and ditches. I'm a little surprised to see the amount of rubbish there is, because when we came, when it was a lot more flooded and the water was right up to there, you obviously couldn't see a lot of this. We only saw the four or five bags on, that were up high in the hedge line. Dan and Jude have called in the council's clean-up crew to get on top of the pollution risk. Oh, my goodness me. Prams. <sighs> hey, it smells pleasant, doesn't it? Oh. It's horrible. You've got poor putrid smell. It's all rotten food, nappies that people are throwing away. When you just look down the ditch of everything that they've pulled out... That's just in the last hour or so as well. Bear in mind that they've already got 40-odd bags away. It's just stuff like that's more than likely been dumped. That's but the, been some of the bin bags, I think, have probably just been washed down. So is there a case for prosecution? Or are they putting this lot down to an act of God? Uh, in this one, you've got nappies, rotten food. I like the job, but not this part. <laughs> not this part at all. Unfortunately for us, we, we're not, we're not going to find anything in this, and this is just a result of flooding. And Probably some fly tipping, fly tipping, more than likely. With little chance of an investigation, all that remains for Dan and Jude is to ensure the site is cleared. Do you think you'll have to come back tomorrow? No. <laughs> Yay! With the wet work almost finished, the pair reflect on a dirty job well done. When the floods go down and you've had waste being carried down on the flood stream. I think people just don't appreciate that it then takes hours of manpower to clear it all. And we've got to, they've still got to get all this onto a flatbed. They've still got to get it to the depot and empty that. When you see how clear it is, it makes our job worthwhile. And we're grateful to the guys that do the dirty work. Although we do get hands dirty quite often. <laughs> and our noses, it's proper minging now. <laughs> it really is stinking. The last time I spoke something like that was definitely Glastonbury in the long drops at the end of the weekend. That's how bad it smells. It's filthy work. I think what I tipped out is mud, water, excrement, all sorts of rotten food. And there's going to be more muck to mop up in Malvern now the floods have receded. <laughs> Good job done. In the daily battle against grime, Waste enforcement officers across the country have a special place in their heart. Who else has this many tyres? I don't know, but I'm tired of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> For tyres. I was very glad that didn't spring off and smack me in the face or anything. A huge headache for the environment and investigators. It can't be landfilled, it can't be burnt, obviously, without giving off noxious glasses, so they have to be disposed of properly. 14,000 incidents of tyres fly tipped last year makes this a huge problem that won't go away. If you put a big pile of tyres in a field somewhere, that will be there in 30, 40 years' time. It will just... it won't disappear. Banned from landfill since 2006, 100,000 used tyres a day have to be processed at legitimate recycling centres like this one. It's full of steel, rubber, fibre, none of them are very easy to reprocess. Thanks to the cost and complexity of recycling tyres, criminal fly-tippers looking to make a quick buck have moved in. 
when you're out and about and you see tyres on the side of the road, all I think is there's some shop, tyre shop, that has let someone come and collect them tyres and they have not checked where them tyres are going to. The tiresome problem cost local authorities a whopping £100 million last year alone. It's impossible to track a tyre. Once it's left the tyre shop, you cannot track that tyre. There are barcodes on it, but no one ever logs it. And the danger they pose goes beyond damaging the environment. Blending into the tarmac, tyres dumped on our highways are an accident waiting to happen. In Buckinghamshire, Enforcement Officer David Rounding employs a tried and tested method when it comes to catching tyre dumpers. In this particular location, we've actually been using surveillance cameras because it's such a heavy flight tipping area. A key tool in the Enforcement Officer's arsenal, cameras helped David tackle one of the most prolific tyre dumpers he'd ever encountered. Four or five years ago, we got a case where there was a chap who was regularly dumping once or twice a week 50 to 60 tyres. He could be at the roadside, at a junction, even in the middle of the road. We were really quite lucky that nobody got hurt with the result of, of his dumping of tyres. And on top of the risk, there was the cost. There was massive expense. We would be spending, on average, £2,000 a week for five months to clean the, to clean the tyres away. Nobody saw him dumping, and of course, with it being tyres, there was nothing traceable. It put us under massive pressure because the expectation was that we would catch him, and, and of course, it really, really wasn't that easy. David decided to turn to his trusty cameras to try and catch the culprit red-handed. This is Black Park Road. It was one of the early places that was hit in October 2014. Um, we'd get piles of tyres in this stretch, so we, we put one of our surveillance cameras to see if we could gather evidence of, of who was doing it. With the cameras set, it didn't take long to pap the perpetrator. We can see that this is seven minutes past 11 at night. These are just the brake lights. The guy has actually arrived with his, with his headlights switched off completely. But the crafty criminal slipped the net using the cover of darkness to evade detection. If he had driven in here, with his lights on, we might well have detected him straight away with this first sighting. The danger posed by these dumps was made all too vivid by what David's cameras captured next. The next vehicle comes past, um, it's 3.30, and it's very, very heavy rain falling, and they're greeted with a, a large pile of tires right smack in the middle of the road. The pressure was on to catch this dangerous dumper before someone got hurt. 80 miles away in Braintree, Essex, cleaning up after our four-legged furry friends is a never-ending job. After Enforcer Tony came up short on his last poo patrol, HQ has sent him and unwitting colleague Les on another doggy jobby. An address has been accumulating uh, dog waste, dog feces in d black bags, putting out presenting it with domestic waste. This down is going to be a smelly one. This will be a smelly one. A dog breeder's been leaving piles of poo for the local bin men to collect. This is what happens really when you uh, do the job we do. We get all the crappy jobs, literally the crappy jobs. But hey, ho, such is life. Got to keep keep the wife in shoes. Right. Let's do it. Let's have a look. Downwind of the doggy doo doo, it doesn't take long for them to pick up the scent. I mean, there's pongs. Uh, there's one here. Oh, I can't even lift the thing. Yep, we've got maggots. Holy. Holy. <laughs> Shit. All right. I just breathe in a big gust of it. I mean, I don't, I'm guessing I'm way here. I reckon that's what. Jesus! Oh, I can't even lift it. The bag is <laughs> ripping. What annoys me about this is that um, this has been going on for a while, and our guys, you, you were out here about what a week ago. So this is still, this is going on and on and on all the time. 
No matter how disgusting the load, sifting for evidence is just part of the job. And it looks like they've got a lead. Pedigree. This looks like some sort of a certificate from the Kennel Club. So this, this proves that obviously there's, there's breeding going on here. So this potentially is trade waste, what I would class as trade waste. This proves where it's come from, so I'm happy enough for that. Now they've collared the evidence, is the odour dog smelling any sweeter? <coughs> it's disgusting. I mean, it's repulsive smell. And I'm glad I had my lunch before um, before we came out, because <laughs> this definitely would have, I would have lost my appetite. I think I have. Yeah. Domestic waste is no place for commercial loads of doggy dumps, meaning this breed has fallen foul of waste regulations and committed a fly-tipping crime. This is a health hazard. Yeah. Um, the fact that it's a public right of way and you've got neighbouring properties, you've probably got children that has to walk past this, this is not acceptable. Excuse me. This is probably one of the worst I've seen. We've got substantial evidence from this. I'm confident that this, this individual now will uh, be looking to face the prosecution, definitely. And this isn't the first time the enforcement officers have been called out to this location. So, with evidence now linking the poo to the address on the street, Tony serves notice. How are you doing? You're right. It's uh, Tony Lynch from Braintree District Council. I've got to give you notice. What's the plans with this? Because that's that's really in a bad way. Putting it out there is not acceptable. People got to walk past that every day. You need to either do it right by taking it somewhere that's going to take trade waste, because you're a business at the end of the day, so you can take it to somewhere that can take that. No, the dog waste ain't. What's there at the moment would constitute an offence of flight tipping. I mean, we couldn't even lift that bag of, of dog poo. I mean, it was ridiculous. She's assured me that she's going to get a trade waste contract. She's got 14 days to comply with the notice that I've just served. I said, if there's a breach, then we will be prosecuting her. Job done. The residents of this street can now breathe a little easier, thanks to the work of the enforcement officers. Coming up, David's patience is tested to its limits. Basically, I'm out having a job. By the tall tales of this tiresome tire tipper. And basically, I've been arrested for no reason. It was pure coincidence that he and the van ended up in the same wooded, dark area of Buckinghamshire. And a crumbling cliff face in the northeast. Uh, this bit's pretty bad. It's gone very recently as well. You can see it's all falling in. Threatens to turn the beach into a biohazard. This is an ongoing battle. It's, it's a war against waste. In Buckinghamshire, Enforcement Officer David Rounding is pursuing a slippery suspect, dumping van loads of waste tires under the cover of darkness. We're talking about country lanes, no street lighting, black tires, dark asphalt. I was expecting to have a report of somebody swerving into the hedge, at, at least. With a mountain of tires on his patch, David upped the surveillance placing covert cameras at all the tire tippers' hotspots in a bid to catch them before someone got hurt. We only had to get lucky once. He had to be lucky every single time. And, and our luck held, and, and we got the number plate. And the cameras did their job, providing a key piece of evidence to crack the case wide open. Once we got the number plate, we could, uh, we could use various police resources to, to piece together the, the movements of the van um, so we could show that that van was the only one who'd done it. And David wanted to catch the perp red-handed. A few of our officers working with several police officers, we, we, um, we prepared different places where we would hope to pick him up. Uh, this was one of them. This was an area where we expected him to, to have high on his list for dumping. With fellow officers waiting at locations across the county, the trap was set. I was working with a PCSO in, in this vehicle, uh, and there were police vehicles uh, in, in other locations, just hoping to pick him up en route. He actually drove past my car. Incredibly, the suspect played straight into his hands. The call went out from the PCSO to get a police unit to come up the lane from the other end, and, and so he was, he was trapped, basically, between the two of us. After months of cat and mouse, David's plan had finally come together, and the tired dumper was cornered. I had imagined he would just put his hands up, you've got me. No, he turned his van 
and set off down the country lanes. But this rubber bandit didn't know when the gig was up. The van was full of tires, so the police car just stayed in behind him. We heard on the police radio that um, the van had come to a stop in a country lane not far from where we were. So we thought, right, now must, must be cornered, must have got him, and we just made our way as quickly as we could to that location. He stopped right here in the middle of this, this tiny little lane. There's no way to get past. Open the door and he was gone. Having avoided detection for seven months, the criminal on the run wasn't about to give up now. The police officers, they got on the radio that the helicopter wasn't flying that night. So the, the only other option that they had was a dog team, but it took another half an hour probably for dogs to arrive. When the police dog team arrived, basically they thought, he's long gone, we've got very little chance of finding him. With the chance of catching the target fading fast, the investigation was thrown a bone by the canine team. With the police dog handler, with the dog, they've come into this area of, of trees and they've basically found suspect up the tree. He was calling down, can you hold the dog away because I'm just out jogging, I think is what he said when they arrived. At midnight? At midnight, no torch. It was honestly, it was, it was fantastic news to hear that he'd been captured. Um, and he was formally arrested over by the fence across the far side there. David couldn't wait to get eye to eye with the man he'd been tracking for months. He was taken to Highwickham Police Station by Thames Valley Police. We'd got to the stage by then that we had a lot of evidence. Even though the police had got him in custody, it fell to us to interview him under caution. Bit of a homie to fence, if you didn't mention him in question, something that you later rely on in court, anything you do say may be given evidence. Do you understand that? Yeah, I. Why am I here? Caught in the act, and with the weight of evidence against him, David expected the nut to crack. Basically, I'm out having a job, and um, basically, I've been arrested for no reason. <laughs> he said he'd never driven the van. Uh, it must have been a lodger in the house. It was pure coincidence that he and the van ended up in the same wooded, dark area of Buckinghamshire on the same night. I've lost a lot of weight in the last couple of months, so, I mean, I'm jogging all the time. Is it right when you were detained that you were hiding up the tree? No comment. His explanation didn't mesh at all with the evidence that we had, and I don't think either of us believed him at all for a second. David finally nailed his man, hitting him with a £10,000 fine and 200 hours of community service, sending a strong message to other would-be tyre tippers. In all honesty, the thing which makes me most cross is the tiny amount of money that he was actually making. He was putting lives in danger for 50 or 60 quid a time. I, I honestly found that very difficult to understand or, 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 or to forgive, cannot forgive. Over 280 miles away, the northeast of England boasts one of the longest stretches of heritage shoreline in the land. Undulating dunes and sandstone cliffs tower over windswept beaches, and on its doorstep sits the sleepy seaside village of Lynemouth. It's a former coal mining community that now harbors a shocking secret from its industrial past. A ticking time bomb threatening to become a beachside biohazard. But wildlife advisor Steve Lowe has made it his mission to prevent this man-made cliff catastrophe wreaking havoc on the local environment. Uh, this bit's pretty bad. It's gone very recently as well. You can see it's all fallen in. An old coastal landfill is being swept out to sea as wind, rain and waves batter the fast eroding coastline. Up there, there used to be a colliery, and the colliery used this as a bit of a dumping ground for any materials that it had broken or gone out of use or whatever. And then, subsequent to that, we had some landfill activity, whether or dumping activity. Whether that was legal or not, we don't know. We don't actually know what went on. Containing a mixture of both industrial and domestic waste, Steve suspects this site's much more than just an eyesore. OK, guys, well, we've got a bit of kit here. Um, 
litter pickers if everyone wants to grab a pair. So he's rallied the locals to help clear the worst of the waste. I'm biodegradable, but that's not. <laughs> There are over 1,200 historic landfill sites like this up and down our coastline. Prior to the mid-1990s, they had few restrictions about what kind of rubbish could be dumped in them. So little is known about exactly what's lurking within. Trouble is, if you start pulling things out of the cliff, it just makes the erosion worse. This fall that we're looking at here on the cliff hasn't been touched by the sea at all, so that's come down in the last 24 to yeah. 48 hours. Yeah. And there's a big piece at the top of it, which, if the sea comes in with force on the next high tide, is going to fall overnight and will be down where we're standing. Yeah. It's like a time capsule of grime, revealing waste from years of unregulated dumping. There's loads of evidence uh, here. There's stuff that's industrial, and then this stuff that's domestic. Lots of polystyrene. That'll be there for absolutely forever. Here, polystyrene. All sorts of potentially hazardous trash is being unearthed as the cliff crumbles. Looks like a piece of asbestos, um, which in the past people would have just dumped. Now, of course, everyone knows that it's a toxic problem. Steve is convinced these leaky landfills could turn out to be a toxic time bomb with around 120 at risk of erosion within the next 40 years. So whilst the cleanup continues, he's called in a team of researchers from the local university to properly assess the pollution risk. Hey guys, you all right? Hi, Steve. Oh, yeah, nice, nice to see you all again. again. Yeah. Sorry about the weather. I couldn't do anything about it today. <laughs> so do you, do you guys think you'd be able to help us out today? Of course we can. Yeah. Yeah. They're looking for hard scientific evidence in order to raise the alarm about the threat these sites could pose. So we're looking for the bladder rack seaweed, because it's really common in this area. For the research team, the seaweed could be an early warning system of environmental damage. Oh, ransom. It's also a vital marine food source, meaning toxins could be entering the food chain. So this is bladder rack and you can tell from the bladders on it, and it's good for absorbing the metal contaminants. With the seaweed bagged, the team turn their attention to the cliff face. We're currently taking pictures of the cliff line because you can stitch these photos together to create 3D images. This technology could help the team build an accurate picture of the cliff's rate of erosion. Today, this beach is eroding faster and faster by the week, by the months. Partly that's down to the, violent, the more violent storms that they say the meteorological people say we're having. So all the rubbish and the poisonous stuff is coming out of the cliffs and going into the sea, where it's more of a problem. Moving the waste would be the ideal solution. But with thousands of tons to shift on this site alone, the cost would be huge. You know, I think the evidence uh, is before our eyes about what an impact this is actually having. We need to keep on litter picking, really, just to stop this from going at the sea. But it's only a short-term fix. So Steve hopes the scientific evidence gathered today can help raise the alarm about this impending coastal catastrophe. We really got to get on to it. This is an ongoing battle. It's, it's a war against waste. Coming up, it's D Day for Steve. Yeah. Here's some of our seaweed samples we collected yeah. from the site. Could this be the evidence he's been looking for? That's very worrying. If that's in seaweed, it suggests it's getting elsewhere into the ecosystem. While Dan and Jude are called to another kind of chemical cleanup. To me, that actually smells like diesel. Some of it has uh, spilled out. That makes me so angry. Malvern enforcers Jude and Dan are on their way to their next call out, but they're not in a huge rush. This is, of course, a, a good thing of being in a rural district where it often takes us a reasonable amount of time to get to where we're going to the next ply tip. <laughs> We have plenty of time to um, entertain ourselves. <laughs> entertain ourselves coming up with ridiculous songs. There's no, no excuse, excuse for fly tipping, tipping no, no excuse for fly tipping, no excuse for fly tipping. Keep our district tidy. Receding floodwaters in the district have revealed all sorts of unpleasant surprises, 
including a suspected chemical dump. Um, if it leaks into the watercourse, obviously that could be catastrophic for wildlife and for anyone that came in contact with that chemical. The council's cleanup crew arrived to help. So, what have we got? Well, to me, that actually smells like diesel. I can smell it from here. I can smell it from yeah. here. This could be a major problem for Jude and Dan. Diesel's not only highly combustible, but can cause serious health issues too. Do we think that any of the contents have spilled out? The way it was actually placed in here before, a lot of it has spilled out into the right. ditch. Criminal gangs profiteer by selling red diesel, a cheap agricultural fuel that motorists are banned from using. It's been dyed red to make it easier to detect. Of course, it's possible that it was full, nearly full before it was dumped, so you don't know how much has actually leaked into the, into the water there. No. But gangs often use a cocktail of additional toxic chemicals to remove the dye. And yeah. that is just... It's one of the problems, isn't it? Horrible because there's going to be wildlife that use this ditch. There's going to be that water is going to Might soak seep over into that into field. field. I mean, it's just like, oh, it makes me so angry. Criminals dumping this kind of chemical waste run the risk of six months behind bars. We'll obviously report that diesel spillage to the appropriate people yeah. and um, see what action they want to take. But is there a barrel full of evidence to pursue a prosecution? So now you've moved it around a bit, there's absolutely nothing on the barrel that can identify where it might have come from? No, there's nothing on the barrel at all to say where it's come from, anywhere along the line. Damn. Without any evidence to go on, all they can do is clear the site. The outcome for this is really quite disappointing. There's nothing to identify where the bowel came from. And, you know, the really, really unfortunate thing and the thing that I think is the, most, is the worst thing is that the bowel is full of diesel. And that's just, just mindless, stupid idiots who just think it's acceptable just to dump things like that where, where people live. And it's horrible. Back in the northeast, and eroding coastal landfill is causing concern among the locals. You see the, the, the pipe and that that's coming out just in front, front of me there, it just looks like Medusa's locks. Fearing toxic waste is leaking onto the beach, wildlife advisor Steve has tasked a research team from the local university to gather scientific evidence. So this is bladder rack, and it's good for absorbing the metal contaminants. Will the results prove his suspicions are right and allow him to blow the whistle? Anything we find today um, may just be the tip of the iceberg. We might find lots of toxins, and it, it could well mean that with all the hundreds of sites we've got in the UK, this could be a national disaster waiting to happen. Becky is part of the team from Northumberland University working on the tests. So is it your first time in a lab, or...? Um, no, no, I've worked in labs in the past. The team's high-tech monitoring tools reveal the true scale of the problem. So this is the 3D model we made, okay. where we stitched some yeah. of the pictures we I took at the site. I recognise that view. Um, so when you look at the models like this, you can calculate the volume okay. of right. waste that is coming out the cliff. From 2009 to 2017, there's been thousands of cubic metres lost. Really? And so that's potentially all the waste that's stuck in the cliffs is coming out in yeah. that waste loss. The images confirm Steve's worst fears. The trash-filled cliff is eroding fast, spilling landfill waste out into the ocean. But is it also leaking heavy metals into the environment? So here's some of our seaweed samples we collected yeah. from the site. And as you can see by his results, there is heavy metal contents within here, specifically nickel, copper, zinc and arsenic. Arsenic is a poison, potentially lethal to the area's wildlife. That's in the seaweed? In the seaweed, yeah. yeah. It shows that there is contaminants reaching the ecology within the yeah. area. The seaweed samples weren't anchored onto the rocks on the beach, which means they could have been washed up from elsewhere along the coast. 
but the results are still shocking. Obviously, this is a snapshot in time, but it's worrying to see that there's um, at least four of those are well over the standard. And from my point of view, that's very worrying. If that's in seaweed, it suggests it's getting elsewhere into the ecosystem. But Steve hopes his evidence gathering will prompt an urgent national conversation about these sites. The researchers have actually shown me quite conclusively that the coast is eroding much quicker than we thought. They also have demonstrated that there's actually quite a lot of um, uh, contamination getting into the ecosystem. We've got 1,200 of these sites, and at least a third of those are in important ecological areas on the coast. Action is needed now to prevent a national crisis along our coastlines. We really need to get to grips with this. We need more effort more investigation, and we need some resources to actually do something about it. That's certainly what I'm going to be campaigning for in the local area on the Limehouth site. Tireless waste warriors like Steve are on the front line in the fight against grime. And for our other waste warriors in Malvern, Jude and Dan, it's been a stressful, emotional week of mopping up after the floods. But when they survey their kingdom, it's all worth it. Oh. Oh, there, there you go. go. It is worth it when you get to the top. What Definitely. a view. Wow, what a view. Wonderful. You can see for miles. You can see across all the other hills. All the hills. You can see behind you all the way to Wales and the, what can. the weather's doing. It's just one of the most beautiful places. It's a gorgeous view, full of happy memories of grime busting. One there. We had one there. Yeah, there, there, definitely there. There. Yeah, definitely there, on that road up there. Yeah. And that's just what we can see in this little bit. The fact that our beautiful countryside is being destroyed makes me massively angry, and so angry that sometimes when I go out to things, I can get quite emotional. And, you know, it's like it's not fair. It's not fair on the animals that live there, the people who live there. It's just not fair on the environment. Oh, you got me there. Yeah. <laughs> I really wasn't going to cry then. Hello. Where yeah. are you going then? Some jacket pocket there. Might have some money in it. Next time on the front line of filth. In Oxford, the search for a needle. Uh, even I'm more shocked. Definitely doesn't mean rummaging through a haystack. Blood all around it. It's not good. And Walsall's waste warriors. Probably about four ton, aren't they, Anne? Find a sack full of evidence. I was wondering if you could um, enlighten me as to how it got there. And in Huntingdonshire, can covert camera traps catch the fly tippers? They are going to fly tip. We hope they fly tip in an area where we've got our cameras. Hey.